We're going to move through here, and uh, I want to share a thought before we go home. <clears throat> this is something that, uh, let me give you a little bit of background here to my story. Uh, my dad was graduated from Tennessee Temple in the early 70s and began uh, working with a couple churches and began doing church planning with the military, mainly in Florida and then in uh, North Carolina. And then after he had done a plant in North Carolina, we were in between, and we were back in Texas at our home church in Garland, and uh, a gentleman from Germany contacted our home church. And it was an officer, and he said, look, we have three bases here, but we don't have one single church uh, that's willing to service our men. So would you consider, is there a man there at the church that'd be willing to come over and start a church here? And we'd pay half the support. So uh, they contacted my dad, and within a month, we were over, we were over in Germany. And we stayed there about 12 years, 12, 13 years before we had to come back over homeschooling issues. But through it all, growing up, you hear a lot of stories. Uh, what ended up happening is when we got over to Germany, um, the support wasn't there. It didn't exist. And so when the value of the dollar fell, we didn't have any money. And so the stories of how God provided again and again and again for the family all through those years. And as a child, you grow up with that, you hear that, but it's not in your life. You just hear of it or you see it in your parents' life, or it's your family. You know, it's not you, it's your family going through it. So you experience a lot of things, but it's not personal. So as you become an adult, that's when God's like, okay, I'd like to work in your life, but are you willing for it? Are you open for it? And this last year in Uganda, what we ended up, we spent a, a year in Uganda. Two weeks before we flew out, we found out we were expecting. So uh, that threw a kind of a wrench in the works in our mind at first. Okay, God, you know, do you still want us to go? Do you want us to stay and just have the baby here? And uh, we both felt at peace about going. And so we went. And the area we were going in is the highest rated area for malaria in Uganda. And you could guarantee just get it a couple times a year. And so we were just praying, Lord, if you're leading, give us a peace and we're going to go forward with it. But as God took us through the year, it was just one example after another of, here, I'm going to train you here. I'm going to teach you here. And I think God just can ask the question, are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to take the step? And so as we look at this passage, let's keep that thought in mind. And I'm going to share a verse in just a second. But are you willing? Really, how far are you willing to go? Uh, so many times I've heard the example of missionaries on the field. Uh, what will take you off the field? What would it take? to bring you off the field. Uh, for some of us, it's not that much. For others, it's a lot. For some of it, it's nothing. They would stay there forever. So what are you willing? If God were to call you a field, if God were to call you to take more active in ministry, if God were to lead you another step in life, whether it was good or bad, are we willing? As we look in Acts 27, we find a guy named the Apostle Paul, and we'll give a little bit more history in a second here, but if you would, read with me in verse number 18. They're stuck in a ship, they're in a storm. It says, we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighten the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So we find that they're now in the third day of a storm, and already they're throwing overboard everything that would normally save their life on a normal voyage. But they're so desperate, they're throwing it overboard. Verse 20, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now jump with me to now to verse number 27. But when the 14th night was come, they've now been in the storm for two solid weeks. The third day, they're already thrown out everything in the ship that they can lay hands on, and they come to a place just a few days later where all hope is gone. Well, now it's two weeks of that. All hope is desperately gone. But you quickly find, verse number 27 again, but when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that we drew near some country. Jump with me to verse number 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. So now I just want to take this little thought. Are you willing to believe God? Are you willing to believe God? Let's pray quick and then we'll get into the message. Lord, I sure do thank you for the evening and I thank you for the day. Not too often are we able to just uh, sit back and enjoy a, a message and fellowship. And Lord, be, be rebooted ourselves. And I thank you for the church here being willing to just host us and allow us to come. But Lord, I pray we'll open our minds, we'll open our hearts. Lord, I open up my mind and heart. 
And as you speak, Lord, I pray that we'll just listen and we'll just follow. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we come to Acts 27, something interesting here, uh, Paul the Apostle is not some novice Christian. He has now been a veteran missionary. He's now been a veteran apostle for many, many years. So when we come to Acts chapter number 27, it starts in Acts chapter number 8. We find him at the feet of a guy named Stephen, and he's holding the coats of those that are stoning him. Now, we know from history and we know from Scripture also uh, very strongly that Paul was at the head of the destruction of the church at Jerusalem. Uh, it's no hidden factor. In fact, he did his job so well that the church literally exploded. It just went to pieces. The only ones left in Jerusalem were the apostles and just a few left. And so now Paul, in Acts chapter number 9, has now left Jerusalem with the focus of the same way I've destroyed the church here. I'm going to Damascus. I'm going to destroy it there. Once I'm done there, I'm going to go to... His goal is a lifelong goal. I'm going to stamp this religion out. Well, then, of course, we know the story. In Acts chapter number 9, the Lord reaches them sees him saved, and calls him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And again and again and again, and when you look in 2 Corinthians 11, I think it's interesting, he lists some of the persecutions he went through. He went through a lot. But even back in Acts chapter 9, if you remember, Christ, the God told him, look, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. So it was no unhidden thing to Paul that he was going to go through problems. But you look in 2 Corinthians 11, and as a better man of God, he has gone through a lot. He's gone through a ton, more than any of us have ever gone through. So we come to Acts 27. We're not dealing with a man here who is a novice. We're not dealing with a man here who hasn't gone through persecution. We haven't gone, we're not dealing with a man who hasn't gone through a couple ships sinking underneath him. He spent time in the ocean. He spent time in the water. But we come to this storm. In Acts chapter number 27, verse 10, it says, And he said, and, and Paul, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt, and much damage, not only of the lady and ship, but also of her lives. So they're setting sail. The history of this passage here is Paul's on a ship headed to Rome to stand before Caesar. He's a jailbird. He's locked up. But even as in that situation, as a man of God, he comes to the centurion and says, look, you're in charge of the ship right now. I wouldn't leave port. It's just not a good time. And of course, we know the story. He leaves port. And as we walk through... Verse 15, we find, verse 14, we find, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladin. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up, we let her drive. And then we, we read these verses already in verse number 18. They're exceedingly tossed. They begin to lighten the ship of everything inside. Verse number 19, they're now thrown overboard, all the tackling. But then verse 20, look at this again with me. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved, was then taken away. Now, the writer of Acts is a man named Luke. He traveled with Paul quite extensively. And Luke makes no differentiation here between Paul or any other man on the ship. He says, all hope that we should be saved is gone. And it's in the middle of this storm. They're still standing on that same ship that's breaking apart under their feet. The very next verse, it says, verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Now remember me, the night before, they're standing on the ship and all hope is gone. The night before, Paul and Luke, every man on board said, okay, we're finished. I told them not to leave port. They left port. We're done. We're going to die. The next morning, Paul stands up and says, hey, be of good cheer. What made the difference here? What made the difference? We already looked on to verse number 27, but we already looked on to two weeks later. They're still in the storm, and we find that the veteran men of the ship, the sailors, are the one fleeing out of the ship. It's done. It's finished. They're on a lifeboat. They're going to head out. But it took an inexperienced sailor man. It took a man that spent more time in the water than on the ship. It took a man of God to say, no, 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 no. Cheer up. Stay on the ship because God's given us a promise. What made the difference here? What made Paul stick above the rest? I think this is interesting because you look back in history and, and sailors have never been godless men back through history. They're always very, very religious men. Many times, historically, before they would leave, uh, they would worship to the God of their city or to the God of their region. You find later on, in fact, in, in this story later on, Paul gets on a ship that's dedicated to a God. That's very common. Many times they were dedicated to a God for safety. But these same sailors, when they would return home, would once again sacrifice, thanking God for a safe voyage. These aren't godless men. So what made Paul stick above the rest in the sense of 
he could stand up before these veteran men, these veteran sailors, and say, no, 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 don't jump ship. Stay right on the ship. What made the difference? Were these men godless? No. They believed in God too. Now, maybe a different God, but they weren't godless men. So what made Paul stick above the rest? Uh, we look in uh, Hebrews 11, book of Hebrews, a little history. Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. It's written to the people of God, the ones who believe in Jehovah God. And as Paul is writing, uh, as most people believe he was the one who wrote the book, we look through and, and God is speaking to him. When we come to Hebrews 11, it's, it's what we call the chapter of faith. It's men and women of faith that the Jews looked up to, that the Jews looked back to and said, wow, look at these people. These are people that we respect. But then you go through some of the lists, and it's not everybody that we would put in that list. I mean, you look at a guy named Samson, or even just Rahab. Why would, why would she go into a chapter of faith, of great faith, somebody of amazing faith? But we have to remember, Hebrews was not man's words, it was God's words. And the people, the men and women that are in that chapter were not chosen by Paul. They were chosen by God specifically for a reason. So if I could say, if we could look at God for a second, and as he's looking across the generations of time, and he's looking at each generation, if we come to the chapter of faith, it's this generation. Who sticks above the rest? Well, Samson. He was a man of faith. David. He was a man of faith. And as God's looking across the generations of time, he sees those men and women who went beyond the norm. But was it because of their physique? I mean, you look at a man named Noah. Quite a unique man. But one of the things about Noah is he did not live in a godless generation. I mean, you have to realize Adam had just died a couple generations before. So they knew the one true God. They knew who he was. They knew what he was about. Now, many of them didn't serve him, but they certainly didn't uh, refuse to believe in him. They knew who he was. So what made Noah unique? What may know the type of man that God would say, hey, you're going to go in this chapter of faith and I'm going to do something great with you. You look at Moses. I thought it was interesting. So many times today we like to say, you're an older person, you know, don't, don't consider starting a ministry or going heavily into ministry. Well, Moses was 80 years old. And nobody debated that. God said, no, 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 you're the man. You're going to start a ministry. You're going to start to lead my people free. You take a man, these different men like this, uh, I just read the book of Daniel through uh, in our devotions, and uh, a man that even when he was an old man was still standing strong, still going forward. But what made these men unique? You look at a Moses, he wasn't living in a godless generation. I mean, when he went back to Egypt, they still believed strongly in Jehovah God. They hadn't given up. So what made him a man that God picked? Can I say, I believe it's in this one little thought. Look with me in verse 22 of chapter 27 of Acts here. Paul speaking, he says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Now, if you'll remember when Paul was sitting in a jail in Jerusalem, God had come to him and said, Okay, Paul, you know, you came to Jerusalem, I told you not to come, but I'm sending you to Rome. That's where you're going to speak for me. So, here, two years later, God's just reminding him, look, Paul, I told you I'm sending you to Rome. You're not going to die here. Saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Notice verse 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Look with me in Numbers chapter number 13. The book of Numbers, chapter number 13. Let me give you an illustration of the thought we're about to share. Numbers chapter number 13. This is a very unique chapter, very interesting chapter. Here in Numbers 13, they're standing on the edge of the promised land. And if you can remember a little bit of history here, the children of Israel have been in Egypt for how many years? 400 years. 400 years. That's several generations they've been in Egypt. All the people of Israel, all the Jews knew was, in our past, our father Abraham was given a promise. That's all they know is the promises God had given to their fathers. And one of those promises was there was a land, a promised land waiting for us. And so they were crying out to God, deliver us, take us to that land. We want this land. So for 400 years, they've been crying out for a deliverer. Now, in chapter 13 of Numbers, they're standing on the edge of this land. They're literally there where they've been waiting 400 years to be. Moses goes around and they pick 12 men, one from each tribe. A little bit of history about these men. All, all 12 of them are 20 years old and older. So they're men. They've gone through the persecutions of Egypt. They've all served as slaves in Egypt. 
Now get this with me, okay? They've all served as slaves in Egypt. They've all gone through the same raising up. They've, they've grown up in the same type of homes. They've all believed in the same God. They've all heard the same promises. And can I say, in the last few weeks of their life here, they've been seeing God do miracle after miracle after miracle. They have seen God work, all 12 of these men. So he picks them out. Moses picks these guys out. In verse 17 it says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or strongholds. And he goes on, but it all comes down to three things. He said, Guys, go ahead and go into the land and spy out the land. God's promise is a beautiful land. Spy it out. Let us know what it's like. Look at the people and look at the cities. Three things. Now let's look what they come back with. Verse 25. And they return from searching of the land after 40 days. Verse 27. And they find Moses. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit thereof. So they come back and they're like, Wow, what God promised us, it didn't even begin to describe the land. This is amazing land. But then go on. What else do they have to say? Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of, of Anak there. Up to this point, have they, have, they, have they deviated from what they were given to do as their job? No. He told them to spy out the land, spy out the people, spy out the cities. They come back and they say the land is beautiful. It's an amazing land. The cities... They're walled. They're huge. These aren't nomadic people. They don't live in tents. These are massive cities. And the people, there's giants in the land, and there's a lot of tribes in the land. This isn't going to be a fun task. But this is where we begin to notice, and we know the story, but let's look at it in context here. Verse number 30, we find Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now remember, these folks just left Egypt. They've been in 400 years of slavery. They don't know how to fight a war. They don't even have weapons. These people are coming as slaves to a land that God promised them, but that he promised, I'll go before you. I'll push them out of the land. So Caleb comes from the angle of, let's go. Let's, I mean, let's go now. Go forward. But then look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Stand these 12 men side to side. They're about to go spy out the land. They believe in the same Jehovah God. They have the same history. They were slaves. Their families were slaves. Their grandparents were slaves. They've been slaves for 400 years. But all 12 of these men are fit, strong young men who know the promises of God. And as they step into the land, they know God has already given us this land. This is the land that we already own. And God said he would go before us. But when they come back, it's a little different story. Whereas one, and we find out two, Joshua joined him, say, let's go forward, let's now, let's jump into the land. We can do it. We are well able to overcome them. Ten of them step back and say, no, nah, we can't do this one. What happened? What broke? These 12 men, what in their lives became that snapping point? You see in the book of Psalms, chapter number 31, I believe, there's a verse that says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that he orders your steps? A lot of people don't. A lot of people believe you just kind of form your own way through life and just serve God. No, 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 no. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And the second part of that verse is, and he delighteth in his way. So easy it is. And can I say, if I could take these 12 men, as they step into the land of promise, they've all had the same steps in the sense of slavery, Jehovah God, their grandparents serving God, their parents serving God. They had that same heritage. But as they step into the lands, the steps God ordered for them led directly into the land. And whereas two of them we're willing just to believe God. Get this. Ten of them said, we'll believe in God, but believing in Him is a whole new world. We can't do this. And whereas ten of them stepped aside onto their own path and said, now we still believe in Jehovah God. I mean, we have, we're not throwing away God. We just don't want to follow His steps. 
that he ordered for us. It can't be done. Physically speaking, it can't be done. If you'll think back with me, Acts 27, you have these veteran sailors. They've been sailing the seas for how many years? You have a centurion that's been back and forth across the waters. You have an owner of the ship and captain of the ship. They know the seas. But yet, after two weeks of battling the sea, it comes to a point where the sailors said, okay, we're drawing close to an island, we're getting off the ship. And the man of God says, no, 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 I may know nothing about the seas. I may know nothing about sailing. But I know one thing. God's given me a promise. And I can believe God. While the same ship, you, you have to remember, just two days in or a day or two into this storm, they came under an island and they were tying up the ship to keep it from falling apart. Two weeks into it now, it's the same ship, still falling apart, and the man of God says, no, 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 let's go forward, because I believe God. What made the difference? What made the difference between a man named Noah, who literally believed in God just like anybody else, but God said, no, you belong in the chapter of faith, and all his brethren that died, and you hear nothing about them. What made the difference between an Abraham who in the book of Joshua you read and Joshua gives testament, his family, Abraham's family, wasn't godless. What made him unique? There was a man who stepped out going to a land that he knew not where it was. He just believed God. There's something about a Christian. Can I say, if we could go around the world, let me take you to Africa, let me take you to Central Africa, where some areas have yet to be touched by any sort of what we would call civilization, by the outside world. Let me take you back to the middle of nowhere where, can I say, very rarely anywhere in the world nowadays has there never been a foreigner in a certain area. But if I could find a place like that, Papua New Guinea would probably be one of the best places anymore. Take you way back in the middle of some mountain village. Ask them the question, do you believe in God? Well, of course we believe in God. Well, let me take you to northern Africa where the terrorists are just running rampant, and can I say all throughout the world now, but even in Central Africa where they're starting to get more and more of a stronghold, and ask them that question, you already know the answer. Well, sure we believe in God. I mean, why do we do all this? But let me bring you home. Let me bring you back to your church, to two young men that have grown up. Same church, same type of families, same ministries, same God. And yet, as you see these two young men grow up, they get married, they have families, and one of them, you can see God all in his life. His family, his friends, his co-workers, they see God. But then, you have another young man, while he still believes in God, while he still attends church, and maybe they work the same ministries. But you can't see God in his life. There's something lacking. What makes the difference? You know, I say, I think a lot of it hinges on, can we just believe God? See, when God created us, the Bible says, before I was conceived, he knew me. Isn't that amazing? And yet, as God created us and he formed us, was God's mind the individual steps? Maybe, maybe not. But I do know in God's mind, he already had a finished result. He already had where we would step out of this world and into heaven, and we could look back, and he already had the accomplishments he had designed for our life. He had his will already planned out. And I think it's amazing as we go through life, I often tell the story, my dad is a very, very small man. Uh, he's a little bigger now, but when we came back from Germany, uh, he was only about 100 pounds. So he's a very, very small man. And I outweighed him and outgrew him, you know, even as a little kid. So as we would go visiting or soloing, We'd be walking along. He's a very fast walker, and he would just be walking along. He'd get to the door a good half a minute before I would get there, and he'd be like, come on now. You're the teenager here, not me. But I almost feel that's how God is sometimes. Before you were conceived, I knew you. When you were born, I already had your steps ordered for your life. I already had in my mind where I wanted you to go. So as I go through life with you, just take that step. I ordered it. I know where it goes. I can already see ahead. Just, just take the step. Just take the step. And so many times we come to the end of our life and God is here. He's right where he designed us to be. He's right where all, all of those things in life, all those steps ended right here. And he's looking back and saying, where are you? Look where you could have been. Look where I had designed you to be, but because you couldn't believe me. You believed in me. You didn't stop ministry. 
You didn't stop believing in me. You just couldn't take that step in your life. That was just a little too much for you. As a result, I'm here. Right where I designed you to be. And you're there. And the regret we'll have. Why? Not because we designed our own path. No, 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 no. Because we just didn't believe God in walking and in delighting in the steps he had ordered already for our life. There was a gentleman back in March. I was in a conference, and an amazing story. And uh, as a child, just to just give you a picture of God ordering the steps, as a child, both his, when he was born, both his mom and his dad were drug addicts and drunks uh, very, very heavily. His dad left him as just a small child, so his, his mom literally traveled the U.S. financing her drug addiction. They lived with every man in the sun. They lived in every condition. There was an older couple, a missionary couple, that had been on the field that uh, had to come back to the U.S. for health reasons. And so they moved into a, a really rugged side of town in Louisiana uh, just to continue their ministry uh, since they weren't able to go back over. And they found this family, the mom and some of the kids, living underneath a bridge on their side of town. And they pulled them out, gave them a home, rented a home for them, Give them a home. Every morning, they would send the kids off to school, but before they would feed them breakfast, before they would send them off to school. And as they were feeding them, they would tell them stories of Africa, all these stories from Africa, all these stories from Africa. Well, fast forward years. They traveled literally, and they only stayed there a couple months, he said. They were literally traveling everywhere in the sun. He's now an adult, and his future father-in-law leads him to the Lord. Get saved, completely changed life. And, and there's so much we're skipping, but how God just ordered steps, ordered steps, ordered steps. He gets saved. His life's turned around. He goes to college. He never finished the sixth grade. Never finished the sixth grade. He went to college, got a degree, got another degree. He ended up getting a doctor's degree in crisis management. He's traveling the world for the UN, uh, working with organizations all over the world for evacuation plans. They were back home at their missions conference, and God called them to the mission field. And his wife, they, they went on deputation, did all that. And right before they went over, his wife said, you know what, you ought to try to find that older couple that you always talk about, that gave you that home for those two months. And uh, see if you can track them down. Just let them know what you're doing today. So he, got, he finally got a hold of the guy, though he had passed away. The man was quickly dying of uh, kidney failure, I believe. But they talked for a while. And then right before they got off the phone, the man asked them, so where are y'all going? He said, we're going to Burkina Faso, Africa. And the old man began bawling his eyes out. He said, that's right where we worked. And we've been praying all these years that God would send another young couple to take our spot. Who are we to say we can order our steps? Who are we to look at God and say, no, 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 I know this step better than you do. Let me design this step for my life. Who would have thought that a young man, can I say, an old man sitting on the other side of that line, thinking back all, all those years, saying, that little boy that we pulled out from underneath the bridge became the missionary that we've been praying for all these years. Who would have ordered those steps? And yet, he just delighted in the steps God had given for him. You fast forward a few years. They've been in Burkina Faso since 2007. Because of his work with the UN, Burkina Faso is, is the country with the most terror cell groups that work all throughout Africa. I mean, it's a, it's a country just completely blown to pieces uh, by Islam and by terror cell groups. And because of his work with the UN, he's a target. Him and his family are a target. They work in a group of three missionary families, work together, and they're always moving because they're always being targeted. Just to tell you a little bit of the safety factor, one of the husbands and one of the daughters was killed just a couple years ago by one of the terror cell groups. Uh, it's not a safe area to be in. But they were out in a preaching point, holding a, uh, and they were also, because of their work with the UN, the UN would finance it, and they were allowed to pair their ministry work with the UN work. And uh, they were out at a preaching point doing a feeding center and uh, also preaching. And his family, they didn't get back to town in time, so his family slept in the truck that night, trying to stay away from mosquitoes and malaria. And they got out of the truck in the morning. He went to pull the bags of rice out of the truck, and they were just chock full of mosquitoes, just full. And they'd been in the truck the whole night. Within two weeks, his whole family comes down with cerebral malaria. And for a foreigner, especially not having dealt with a malaria before, it can kill within three to four days. It's a super deadly form of malaria. They ship him out to the U.S. By the time they find out what was wrong with him, ship him out to the U.S. They barely saved his son's life. His family was fine. They all got well. But his son will live the rest of his life with massive physical issues because they didn't get to him in time. But they went back. A few months later, one of his boys, bacteria on his fingers, rubbed his eye. 
and his eye melted, and he's blind, both eyes for life. But they stayed. And I asked the guy, I said, what makes you stay? Because for some of us, we go overseas, and I don't know, some of you have been posted overseas, but when you're as a missionary, many times you're alone. You don't have a family member. You don't have another white guy or American guy to talk to. You, you are alone by yourself with God many times. And it gets discouraging. And then you start having your family get severe medical issues, as he did, and we just go home. But can I say, through it all, you could see that they just delighted in the steps the Lord had ordered for them. What's the goal? What's the point in mind? Can I say, is it not the goal of being able to step across into heaven and have God say, well done, a good and faithful servant? Is that not the goal? I don't care if you have a huge ministry. I don't care if you have a small. I don't care what you have. My question is, are you willing to just believe God and take that step that he's ordered for your life? This message came together for us uh, near right as we were about to have the baby. Um, perfect pregnancy. We were, we were praying constantly that the Lord would keep her from sicknesses, malaria especially. It can be quite serious, um, especially the first time getting malaria and also being pregnant as a foreigner. So we were really asking prayer that she would be kept from it, and she didn't get one sickness the whole year. Uh, no bacteria issues, worms, of course, but that's common. But no bacteria, no viruses, nothing. Not a single issue the whole year. Well, then two days before the due date, we had moved down to the capital to actually have the baby, and she began having what ended up being preeclampsia. And I don't know, my mom had 10 kids, never dealt with it. But maybe some of you ladies have. And uh, over there, it's a little different story, just because we don't know, you know, we don't have everything we have in the U.S. here. But they were able to catch it in time. I remember the morning the doctor came in. Uh, we came in the one night, and they called our doctor and said, why don't you just keep her overnight? Uh, they didn't know what was up, but they said, keep her overnight. I'll see her in the morning. She's close enough to the due date. He comes in in the morning. He put that baby monitor on the heart, on the baby's heart there. And uh, even as he was putting it on, the, the heart rate was already below 100 and just dropping, 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 dropping. And uh, within 15, 20 minutes, she was on the table and had the baby. And they said, everything's going to be fine. You know, you'll be fine now. And praise the Lord you came in when you did, because otherwise you wouldn't have been here. And so three days later, we're still in the hospital because of some more issues. And that morning, the doctor had said, I'm going to let you go, but let me go ahead and keep you till tonight, and I'll let you go tonight. Well, that afternoon, right at lunch break, and an after lunch break is lunch break. Doctors are gone. Nurses are gone. Everybody's gone. Um, but she ended up going to full clampsy, and it's rare, but it does happen. And the blood pressure shot through the roof, convulsions, everything else. So I'm running around the hospital trying to find anybody, just anybody to give her medicine. And uh, it took a while. Finally, they got the medicine in. It was in a box that was locked. Nobody could unlock the box. They ran and grabbed somebody to break the box. And it was just one thing after another. Once it was all said and done, the doctor came in and said, John, um, your wife's blood pressure went too high for too long. And after, with how high it was, after seven minutes, she's going to have hemorrhaging in the brain. There's going to be permanent brain damage. And she was in at least twice that long. So it's going to be probably pretty major. And they wheeled her out to do a brain scan. And as you're sitting there, you're saying, God, this? We followed your peace in our life. We sought counsel, and they said, okay, if you're feeling at peace, go forward. We're feeling at peace. We did everything we knew to follow and delight in that step you had for us. And now the baby almost dies, and now the mother's left permanently brain damaged for life. Why? And again, if I could put you in the situation, you can't call mama. There's no church member that's going to come and visit you, and there's no missionary around that's running to your side. You're by yourself. And once it was all said and done, praise the Lord, they came back to zero brain damage whatsoever, a miracle. But you're not in that moment. See, as you're taking those steps God's ordered, everything's in the future. You're like, God, this doesn't make sense. This physically, mentally, spiritually, this does not make sense to me. Should I take the step or not? It was a few days later that I was talking to my dad, and uh, he said, John, you've grown up your whole life believing in God. It's just time to believe him now, because this doesn't make sense. Are you willing to just believe God? Because it took a man of God on a ship that was going under to say, look, physically, leaving the ship makes Perfect good sense. There's an island close by. We have a safety boat. Let's get off the sunny. But because God said, no, you're going to be fine. Cheer up. Stay right here. 
can stick on the ship, even though it makes no physical sense whatsoever. In our life, we come across so many different things, and we can, can I say, we could go on all night seeking to make it personal, but in the end, I believe this is an area that only you and God know, and I've even said, and I believe it, only you and not even your spouse knows this area. Because this is an area where God, in my heart, I either know I've taken that step or I haven't. My spouse can never know. But I do. Because it's in my heart. Have we followed the steps God's ordered for us? And isn't it interesting, just to end with this, there's a guy named David in that Hebrews 11. When you look through his life, there's a guy named Samson. It's not a perfect life. David committed adultery. He murdered her husband. He went on and murdered a bunch of other men, then counted the people and murdered a bunch of other people. I mean, David was not the most perfect man in the world, neither was Samson. And yet, for David, God said, he will fulfill all my will. When God orders our steps, it's not because we're going to be perfect. It's because he knows this is where I want you to be when you finish your life. Are you willing to step in the steps I've ordered for you? Are you willing to delight whether it's the mountaintops, whether it's the valleys, are you willing to just step forward and say, God, I'll believe you on this one?